So give a warm welcome to Sofia. Great, thank you everyone. Yep, so today my talk is called In Defense of Learning on the Job. Um, when I was first talking about this presentation to Esther, I was like talking about a blog I wrote in 2017 called How I Taught Myself to Code. And I was, like, I've given that as a talk before, but I realized 2017 was a really long time ago. <laughs> and that was actually only uh, three years into my career. And so I've been doing this for 10 years now, and there's a whole lot more to how I got into the industry and how I got to where I am now, rather uh, like instead of just the part where I taught myself to code. I'll be speaking about that as well, but this is kind of a retrospective of the whole career and like what I learned from it. So. Who am I? I'm gonna, this is the third intro of me today, but bear with me. <laughs> Sophia Clark, self-taught coder, cat mum, Aquarius, and I have ADHD. I'm not gonna talk about ADHD in this, but I feel like it gives context for why some of my decisions are the, seem the way they are. Um, I only found out I had ADHD at 28 years old, and that might have changed my career if I knew earlier, but hey, we're here now. Um, the things I talk about the most are probably my cat, Logan, and Taylor Swift. But you know what Taylor Swift looks like, so you get two Logan pictures, bribing you with cat pictures to get that attention. <laughs> so throughout this talk, I'm not going to go into detail about imposter syndrome. That's why they're on screen, imposters, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I did want to mention it because it's followed me through my career. And as my career has gone on, I've had, I have a more nuanced view of it, I think. Um, and I also think imposter syndrome and the Dunning-Kruger effect are very related. And I'm going to go into this more later, but I wanted to like put that in your brain now so you bear in mind when I come back to this at the end of the talk. So I started by uh, at university, but I did physics at university. Um, I don't regret it because I really love it. I did an, uh, physics and astronomy. And um, in astronomy, I did a module where we made a magnetometer to de detect solar flares. And in that, it was really enjoyable. And I saw that the professor was writing Python to get that data for us. And I was like, that's cool. I want to do that bit. And he's like, well, that isn't part of your course. So don't worry about it. And I was like, I'm going to bear that in mind. Um, and then I also worked part time in a restaurant. And I feel like that's just important to mention because that also like framed a lot of how I viewed university and also my future career. Like, I not a lot of my peers were doing part-time jobs, and so I think I had kind of a different experience because of that. I really enjoyed it, and I think it helped me like get used to working a bit earlier. I graduated early in 2014. This isn't a flex. A lot of me like I did so well. I graduated early. I graduated early because I was impatient and I wanted to start in the games industry. And again, if I'd known I had ADHD, then I might have been a bit more rational about that. But whatever, I did it. <laughs> and what did I learn from this? Well, I did MATLAB. That's like a coding language um, that you sort of uses Python um, for data. And again, it was one of those things where I was using it. And I'm like, I'm enjoying this part of my degree. Maybe this is something that I want to pursue. Oh, and throughout my talk, I'm going to be putting down what I learned, and there'll be coding languages or frameworks. I'm not necessarily going to go into detail of them, but like they might be things that you want to like look up later if you're interested. So just a heads up there. So yeah, MATLAB. Um, I learned that Python seems cool, like I said. Um, the work-life study balance from having the part-time job and being a student and all of that. I'm glad that I got that early on. And I probably learned some physics. Um, who knows? But I did that, so we'll see. And I think learning how to study became really useful later on as well, because then I started teaching myself how to code. Um, like I said, I had that interest in MATLAB. I saw my professor using Python. And I was like, I think that's what I want to do. So it was a natural choice for me to start learning Python. Um, it's much easier to learn something, at least I think it's much easier to self-teach something when you have a project in mind. And I knew that I wanted to make games. I've always loved video games. And so I started working through this book, Invent Your Own Computer Games with Python. It does things like making sort of text adventures with Python. And it was really fun to work through it. And um, the author, Al Swigart, Swigart, Swigart he um, makes a lot of other Python books, like one called Automate the Boring Stuff as well. Um, and I really recommend all of his stuff, because I think he does a great job of making access it accessible. Um, so I was also uh, using a Raspberry Pi. That's what this is. It's just a little computer that, in British schools, they give them out to like kids for them to learn how to program. Um, and I used it as like a little mini dev machine. I also learned a bit of Linux while I was um, 
while I was doing that. And I think that just because it was novel and exciting, it was a nice way for me to like get into it. So I was also writing blogs as I went. I think writing writing down what you're learning is a good way to commit it to memory. And also, you're making sure that you understand it well enough for someone else to read it and learn it. And so that was um, a good way to for me to keep track of what I was doing. I look back on the old blogs now, and it's quite funny. But like I'm not removing them. They can just stay there as like a bit of internet history. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I still use Python all the time, and I love it, and so I'm really glad that I taught myself. So while I was doing that, I um, interviewed for a job at a company called Reloaded Games as a QA tester, and I got it. Um, this was my first job in the industry, a little baby, 21-year-old. Um, I was working on a game called APB Reloaded. Uh, it's like an online shooter with customizations and stuff. The picture is one that I found on my Facebook from years ago where I made a taco cat outfit. Sometimes it was really like fun and silly being in QA because it was like, just go and experiment with the things and see how you get on. And so I found that and I thought, yeah, that kind of is a summary of me being QA. So what did I do? Um, we did play testing, like the feel of the game, going in there to make sure that the balance felt correct. But also the more routine things like a daily smoke test and the weekly regression tests. So smoke tests going into a level, making sure that nothing is like obviously broken. And the weekly regression tests were more like going through and um, like checking that we had a script to go through and make sure that nothing had regressed, like nothing had broken that was previously working. So there was there was the fun of like playing with the customizations and play testing, but we did also have the routine and we, that we had to stick to to make sure that our players had a stable game every week. Um, and targeted testing on new features. So if a new gun or a car came out, like a specific play test oriented around that new feature. And writing up bug reports, it seems uh, frivolous maybe, but there is like a way to do it in a way that a dev can understand what you mean and like, you know, future you can go in and still reproduce that bug. So there is like a way to write it and it's a skill that I learned as I was there. So I learned how game studios work while at this company and um, I think that was really important. Like it's all well and good to like be teaching yourself and making your own games, but like seeing that whole flow of we would make the build, we would test the build, we'd deploy the build and do maintenance every week and things like that. Like seeing the ins and outs of how a game studio work was really exciting and uh, really useful as well. And I learned about version control. Um, this is, again, when you're working on your own game, you might not care about it, but like using, we use a tool called Perforce, which is like common in big uh, game studios. And that's, it's, again, it's just one of these things that at the time I maybe didn't think of it as being that useful, but I look back and I'm like, yeah, that was the first time I got to use all these version control things and like understand why it was important and why I needed it. Teamwork. Um, when you're working in a job, like a you know a proper job in an office, it's just that that much more important to have a team around you that's really good, and also to play nice on that team. Like when I worked in the restaurant, if someone annoyed me, like it what, like it wasn't that big of a deal. I could just like not work with them, or like maybe I would be a bit sassy. I was a teenager, like, <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that I necessarily learned this the hard way at the game studio, but I did like feel the difference from going from my like restaurant job to working in a game studio where I'm like, okay, I need to sit across from this person every day or sit next to this person every day and I can't get annoyed at them because that will make my, my life more difficult. So I think it's just important like to get on in that envi environment. Um, we interacted with the community a lot. Uh, and I think this was almost like dipping my toes into like customer service and like knowing how to interact with your users. Um, and also, as a side note, Gamergate was happening as I joined the industry at this point. So that was throwing me in at the deep end a little bit of <laughs> what to expect from gamers and the users. But it's fine. These are just lessons that I took with me. <laughs> and uh, QA Brain. Um, I talk about QA Brain still in my current job. And I'll talk about it a bit more in this talk as well. But th like the process of being a QA tester and like needing to reproduce something and like try all the different ways that it could work really did rewire my brain and I think it made me a better programmer. 
And um, at this point in my career, my imposter syndrome was pretty high, but also my knowledge was very low. Like I was right at the start of my career. So of course I felt like an imposter because I was new. <laughs> so it's, um, it's just one of those things I look back on and I'm like, you know, may maybe maybe I, not necessarily an imposter, but I was just new. I think it was okay that I felt out of place a little bit. And I was still teaching myself how to code after work. I was 21, so I had more energy back then. Um, and this is when I started learning C Sharp. I used um, one of the Microsoft official courses by a guy called Bob Tabor, um, C Sharp Fundamentals for Absolute Beginners. Uh, they've updated it since I did it, but it's the same guy, the same title of the course. There's just a newer version of it. Um, but I found it so useful. It really takes you from like the very beginnings of um, of like I don't even know how to open the command line, right? Like to learning how to write C Sharp. Um, and it's free, and I just found it really good. And this was also around the same time that I was learning Unity. Um, I don't remember if Rollerball was my first actual tutorial, but it's definitely one that sticks in my brain the most because um, it was it was really useful and memorable. And spoiler for like later content in my talk, but I started working at Unity later on. And I remember being in the office and hearing the voice of the guy who did the Rollerball tutorial and being like really starstruck. Like that was, I think that's why this one is like stuck in my brain the most because it was just like such a cool full circle moment <laughs> for me. So th this tutorial, again, it's been updated for like newer versions of Unity and newer render pipelines. I do still recommend using that if you want to dip your toe into Unity. So learning C Sharp gave me the opportunity to move into a junior dev role at Reloaded. Um, I ha they gave me a small interview, um, but it wasn't like a full-on tech interview. Uh, that So I won't like go into l massive detail, and there are other books and resources out there if you do want to know about the tech interview process. But for me, the programmers took me into a meeting room and gave me some small like coding tests um, to try me out before they moved me into the team, just so they could know like how much of their own time would be needed like teaching me, right? So things like reversing a string or there's like a classic like fizz buzz programming puzzle where you have to like have fizz and buzz print out when there's a number multiple of three and five, uh, just like very simple things. Um, and I also remember that they showed me a bug in one of our internal tools and asked me if I knew how to solve it. And like I remember I was standing next to him at, at his desk and he showed me that he made a build and then the cancel button was grayed out and he then brought up the code and he's like, why do you think that bug happened? And I noticed that like there was a return statement like happening too early or too late. I can't remember the specific details, but I remember pointing it out and like it was it was correct and I felt so proud of myself. And um, but it took me a few years to realize that they definitely added that bug intentionally to test me. <laughs> I was there thinking that I like saved the day, but they would have just added that in. But it was fine. I still I still think it's funny and like I think of it fondly. But like what was what was my like day to day stuff in this job? Fixing bugs, working on our internal tools. Uh, and making scripts for our like internal processes. Like, for example, our producer, whenever she needed to make our release notes go out to the community, she was on our Perforce commit list and like manually typing out everything like in the change logs that the that our programmers sent into the code base. And I was like, that seems inefficient. So one of my first like little productivity tools was using Perforce. Uh, not even the API, like the command line interface, but calling it via C Sharp to like print out the list of the commits into a file automatically, so she didn't have to be typing that. And it felt just so rewarding to like speed up her day and like make things easier for her. So that was uh, that was really nice. And yeah, I didn't even know about APIs at the time, so that's why I did it in a really inefficient method. But it was fine. Um, and what did I learn? Uh, receiving feedback via code review. Again, when you're on your own, you, you're just writing whatever you need to. Uh, but the, sorry, I just blanked out for a second there. Um, but like having people like sit next to me and like talk, like ask me to not only explain my code but like maybe point out where things went wrong. It was just really useful and like it's something that you really like need to get used to when you're a programmer. Like it can be difficult at the beginning, but like people just want the code to be good and don't want users to have a bad experience. So like it's like unlearning to take it personally as well is is a whole thing. Um, building tools, uh, build tools for consoles. So this was like setting up our build pipelines for PlayStation and Xbox and things like that. Um, 
being able to do this at such an early point in my career really like laid a foundation for what I'd end up doing later, and I thought that was a really good experience. And I learned that automation is fun and rewarding, like I said with that story about the change log tool. And how to work in legacy code bases. So think this, I think, was my most valuable lesson at this company, like jumping into a code base that is old and you have to just deal with it. Like very rarely in a job will you be writing code from scratch and like you're making the first thing. Um, jump, knowing how to like navigate a legacy code base and how to fix bugs in that is so important. Um, and it, it seems obvious to me now, but just in case it's not, I'm going to do a quick side side note of how, how do you fix a bug? <laughs> and I, th I thought about um, putting this into a flow chart, uh, but this is just a rough guideline for like where to start. You've been asked to fix a bug. Here are some like things to check, check off. So check if you can reproduce it. Follow the reproduction steps that have been written in the bug. If there aren't any, talk to the QA and figure out what's going on there. See, this is where a flow chart would have been helpful. Like, if, if there's reproduction steps, go on. If not, talk to QA and go back here. You know, you get it. Um, but then once you've found how to reproduce it, you need to find that relevant chunk of code in the code base. So you're opening the code in your IDE, Integrated Development Environment, uh, which is just a fancy text editor, and start searching for words um, for the bit of code that might have been it. Like, that's like it sounds really simple or maybe like but that's really it like so for example with that one with the cancel button i could just search cancel button and find out where this bug might have been happening right um and this is also why like naming conventions and code comments are so important in code bases because if something's named weirdly it's going to be really hard to find it when you need to fix that bug later like a picture yourself or someone else years in the future needing to go back to that bit try and give your things names that make sense. I don't even necessarily mind about like um, code conventions for like style and whatever. Just give them a name or a comment with the name that makes sense to help yourself in the future. So then once you've um, identified that bit of code, uh, use breakpoints or logging to find out what's happening in the code. Um, again, I'm not going into loads of detail here, but uh, a breakpoint is just something that will stop the code running at that particular point. So you the code's running, and again, with this like cancel example, if you put a breakpoint just when that happens, then the code will pause, and you can go into the editor and see what all the values mean at that point. It's really useful, and you can do similar with uh, printing statements to read in the logs afterwards what's happening. It depends what you're doing, but make, make good use of these tools. Repeat point three until you know how to fix it. Again, flowchart would have been good, but just keep figuring out what's going on in there until you know what's going on. Write the fix. Again, I can't really tell you how to do this, but if you've done step three enough, you should, by this point, know what to do to fix this bug. Uh, test it, again, to make sure that your fix works. Try and follow those reproduction steps and make sure that it, the bug is no longer happening. Maybe test it on other platforms, too. Maybe get your QA involved. It depends on how big this bug is. And if you really want to be fancy, you could write a unit test to prevent it from happening again. Um, I didn't know much about unit tests at this point in my career, and I don't think that people generally expect it of junior devs to know much about them, but it's a good way to impress. So you could start off on the right foot there. And so speaking of unit tests, you don't need to read all this on the screen. This is just um, an example of a code cutter from codewars.com. It's a really great self-learning tool. and um, where they'll, get, they'll give you like a puzzle, like the text on the side here is the puzzle. Um, but then it also gives you a pre-written unit test to help you solve the puzzle. And so it's just a really good way for learning why you should care about unit tests and maybe like how to write them um, without needing to jump in at the deep end. Like they're all pre-written, and then you use that unit test to help you solve it. So I like really recommend this website. It's so fun, and I still use it if I just want to like, you know, exercise the code part of my brain for whatever reason. Codewars.com, very good. So back to Reloaded. Uh, in general, I learned about working on a live game, releasing on consoles, localizing text in a game, publisher QA cycles, cert. Uh, it, that might be a thing that comes up if you're working in companies like this. Um, and I also learned a really hard lesson about the industry in that like things don't always work out. The company went bankrupt. <laughs> um, and I think this game is still going, though. Like, I don't know how people are still playing APB Reloaded, but they are. Sorry if anyone likes that game. <laughs> you're, in a, you're a very small group of people who play it. But yeah, I learned an important lesson about the industry and employment laws. <laughs> so 
But in general, I had a good time at Reloaded, and I say thank you, next. So yeah, then I got a job at Unity. Um, I was on the tech support team, uh, specializing in our services. Um, I almost didn't take this job because I wanted to be writing code, and this didn't seem like I'd be writing a lot. But actually, like it worked out really well, and I'm glad that I did take it. Um, as a fly. Uh, so, what what was I doing? I was responding to users' tickets and emails. Um, they would write in and say, "Hey, my my build isn't working, or my ads aren't appearing the way I thought." Things like that, and um, I would speak to them. Sometimes we had uh, preset things to answer, but sometimes I had to like grab their project and have a look at what was going on. So it was really nice, again, ADHD brain, being able to like work on lots of things at once. Like I was never bored in this job. Um, I wrote uh, knowledge base articles for our support website. So if I did solve a, an issue and I thought that it was going to come up again for other users, I would write an article for it on our support website and um, help people without them needing to email in. And uh, working with global development teams, um, that we, Unity has offices all over the place, and uh, b you know, working with a dev team in Texas and Shanghai and whatever. Like it was, it was just a really good experience, like knowing how to do that and how to navigate that. Um, but what did I actually learn from this? How to troubleshoot different build errors. Again, this was something that like came in comes in really handy all the time. Um, but knowing how to read logs and read error messages and then translate that into how to fix a problem uh, was really useful. And again, because I saw so many different kinds of projects, it, I almost developed like a protocol of like how I would do it. I wish I had written it down in like the how to fix a bug style thing, but whatever. <laughs> um, the power of asking the right questions. This was a big thing with support. Like sometimes a user comes in and they don't even know what they don't know. I think it's called like the hierarchy of competence or something. Um, and knowing which questions to ask to get pull out the bits of information. Not only useful when working with customers, but when work with working when working with developers and stakeholders and things like p pulling out what they need to know or what they you need to know. Um, and working with remote teams again, like the same with the global the global development teams. Um, I also gave a talk at Unite Europe. Um, this was a, just a really fun experience because I was able to like learn the thing as I was going, and then, again, like writing the blogs, present it to people so that they could learn from it as well. Um, and then after about a year in this role, a new job came up in the same office, so I applied um, for the release QA team at Unity. Um, our job was to make sure that our alpha and beta releases of the engine were good enough quality because we didn't want our users uh, to use our users as QA. Like we, we didn't want like in, there's certain expectations with alpha and beta, but we don't want them to have a terrible experience. Um, and while I did do some software testing, um, this I also used this as this role as a chance to branch out into other things that I wanted to learn. So I did a lot of um, interacting with other QA teams at the company to figure out what had and hadn't been tested. And then I set up dashboards to show testing status of different areas of the engine, like basically combining all of this spread out knowledge of what was being tested. And like, yeah, I went too early, but set up dashboards. Um, and the, then what I learned, uh, testing software was really different to testing games. Testing games like um, is a bit more freeform, but then there's also more like you're following a script and doing what the script says. But in software testing, sometimes you need to like make something with what you're testing. So I did a lot of like fun prototype games in this job. Like it was a good way for me to like use Unity all the time. So that was that was really interesting. Um, using REST APIs. Again, this is one of those things that I'm not gonna go into detail about, but this is where I started learning how to use REST APIs, making my job a lot easier. And I used uh, what I was doing with those REST APIs to make those dashboards. Um, I made like did some in editor Unity tooling at this point, making like little editor windows and things for like debugging or generally things to make my life a bit easier, and that was just uh, I, again I still use um, in editor tooling for Unity all the time. Um, and Google Sheets scripting, Google Sheets has it like its own scripting language. It's a bit like a uh, JavaScript. Um, super useful. Like if you want to like be making tools and automation, but you don't necessarily want to have like a whole program that needs to be run, look into the Google Sheet scripting. It's so, so cool and so useful. Um, and I gave another talk uh, as well, this time at Unite LA. And this is why there's the picture of Gromit 
on the screen, partially um, because with that job we were just like needing to stay one step ahead of the users to make sure things were good, but also because like, I was very much learning as I went. Like I would learn the thing and then like have to do it. Like it was quite fast paced, but it was really rewarding. And I did that a lot with this talk as well. I had wanted to learn something that was new to me. And so as part of self-learning, I wrote this talk, like I'd learn about it, then like write the bit of the talk and so on. Um, and I think that this is, if you like public speaking or you want to get into public speaking, doing this is a good way for developing your knowledge as well. Because again, you need to present something so that other people can understand it. Um, in this one, I was giving a talk about 2D tile maps in Unity, and I came up with like this Bob Ross analogy to explain it. Um, and looking at this image like really brings it all back to me. Like, and again, with studying in general, being able to put something into like your own words, and um, it, it just helps it stick in your brain so much more. So uh, then I moved into a role, uh, Estet, on the graphics team, um, and I will point out. Uh, I had to apply for the jobs when I moved internally at UNT. Not always when you're at a company where you need to like actually apply for the job and go through an interview process, but I did. Um, so just a heads up there, like that just because you have a job, you might still need to keep up on your interview skills. <laughs> um, I'm using the Gromit GIF again because this was also very much like learning as I went. Like they needed someone to do this, uh, do this position, and I was like, I could probably figure it out. Um, and it, it was fine. <laughs> no, I did, I did well. Um, they were building internal tools for running graphics tests and making packages, and no one really wanted to be the first one to do it because there was this new tooling internally, and like no one wanted to be like the guinea pig, right? So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. I'd, I'd learn it, implement it, and then go back and relearn it and teach it to other people and so on. So I was increasing developer velocity. Um, like I said, there was new tooling here. And it, the old tooling was quite slow. So while I was doing this, I was making it so that our developers could work much faster and get value to our users a lot faster. I improved our package publishing processes. Like if you use Unity, we have like the package manager. And again, like the old processes for that were really slow and annoying and uh, worked on that. And I worked on the graphics test framework. Um, this, this was an in editor Unity tool essentially, but it was just, uh, it was really nice to be using, like making something that everyone internally was using. That was really cool. And uh, I learned that developers can be really stubborn. Um, moving from, and you know, I, obviously I'm a developer, I'm including myself in that, so that's why I feel like I can say that. <laughs> but like moving from an old internal tool to a newer one was uh, stressful. People didn't want to change, they liked the way that they worked. And so having to learn like how to convince people of things and how to make things appealing to people was like a big lesson that I still take with me. Um, but I learned I kind of learned that the hard way in this job. Like graphics developers can be a bit grumpy. Uh, GitHub Actions is cool. Uh, we weren't using GitHub Actions the whole time at, at Unity, but like I started doing some experiments with what we could do there, and it's a really cool tool. So again, if you want to like look into automating things and making your life easier, have a look at GitHub Actions. It's uh, it's very nice to use. Uh, YAML, uh, GitHub Actions, when you're making a config file, it's actually written in YAML. It's like a scripting language, kind of. Um, and also, our internal tooling was, use, was using this. And so, not only was I writing a lot of YAML, but I was building tools to like generate YAML. So, uh, that's, uh, again, like something that has been committed to memory, and I still use it all the time. And I learned how to publish NPM packages. Um, like even though Unity has its like package manager and its own packages, um, it's really just an NPM package under the hood. And so learning that has been helpful in other places. And so it's just something worth like bearing in mind if you want to like get into this package development thing. And I learned some graphics basics. I w I'm not a graphics programmer, and I wasn't like working on the graphics, but I was sort of learning it via osmosis, being in the team, and then it like made my job a lot easier when I'd need to troubleshoot something wrong with the graphics test framework. I'd be like, oh, I vaguely know what could be causing this. GPU, something, something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to do a quick aside again about what even is CI. I sort of, I, I kept like saying it, um, didn't really explain it. CI, continuous integration, C, CD, continuous deployment. Sometimes when we say CI, we're saying shorthand for CI, CD, which is already shorthand, but it's good to just like kind of know roughly about both of them. 
um, CI can be considered the first stage in producing and delivering code, and CD is the second stage, um, releasing and de deploying that code. Um, this is, so, again, you don't need to know all of this, but these are some of the tools that you might use doing CI and CD. And you can see, like, it just, they, they're very interlinked, so that's why people might say CI when they mean both. Um, but when we're talking about developer velocity, automation, making people's lives easier, uh, these are the things that you want to know about. So uh, then I, I forgot I put that in. <laughs> when you accidentally become important at work, and now you have real responsibilities. Um, I was promoted to senior. Uh, I hired my own manager. I, we moved into the main R&D team. The team was moved around a few times, um, but I was essentially doing the same job as before, but with varying stakeholders. Um, this was a lot, um, but one of the things I was doing was working on our performance framework. So when people are using the engine or building things with the engine, we, we don't want to be slow. So I was working on performance framework integration. And uh, again, more dashboards for displaying test data and also performance test data. Mentoring juniors and students as part of this job is a common responsibility for senior programmers to have mentoring as part of the job, even if you're not directly interacting with people. Um, having the mentorship stage is like important. Um, but then what did I learn from this? Um, start small and then expand. Uh, this was specifically it's a general lesson, but the, re the way I learned it was from doing the performance dashboards. My first thought was, oh, well, we'll just display all the data, and then um, they can take from it what they want. Like The developers can just like use from it what they want. No. Um, it would have been a big time sink for me to display all that data. It would have been a big like resource pool, like querying those dashboards, like uh, those databases all the time for that data, and the team would have been overwhelmed if they were presented with loads of it all at once. Um, so actually starting small and then growing based on feedback, you know, agile, whatever. Um, that's something that I had to learn in this job for sure. Um, again, just things for you might want to look up later. I was using SQL and BigQuery for like writing that SQL and pulling from the databases and Data Studio for displaying those dashboards. Um, these are all like, f I don't know if they're free, but they're part of like the Google suite. Um, so that was, it was just really, cool and interesting to be teaching myself that like it was it, with my manager we were in like one of our like performance review things and he's like so what are your goals and I'm like mm, I think I want to like learn more about data driven processes and like having more data for us to know what we're doing and so I think I'd like to learn SQL and he was like okay and then I did it <laughs> so that was quite cool um, and it was useful for the company as well so that was I guess good. Um, and building CI for multiple platforms this time. Like I said, in one of my first jobs, I was building for uh, consoles and whatever, but now I was doing that in a more automated way and getting that whole flow in so that it was smoother. And I was also doing a lot of pull requests, and so there's another side here. Uh, oh, I forgot to do the by paragraph, whatever. Um, but by this point, I'd done loads of PR reviews, and it can be really scary as a junior when you're like assigned to a PR and like have to review it because, you know, you're the only one, well, not necessarily the only one, but like what you, that fly is really annoying me, what you say on this PR could like affect the code, right? So I came up with this like checklist of um, roughly what you should do. If you're assigned a PR, just go through these. Maybe it's an unfamiliar um, code base and you don't know it super well, so like just reading the code won't maybe do much for you. So if you follow these steps, check for typos. Very simple. It will get you reading the code, especially early on in your career. Just reading, like checking for typos and make sure you're like scanning that code and you can still contribute on a PR even if it's like in a minor way. Uh, pull it locally and test it locally. And this is where my QA brain comes back in. Um, I'm so thankful for that background as a QA tester because like, if I'm having a day where I maybe don't feel like reading a lot of code or that I, there's something that I don't understand, or I can just pull it locally and like put my QA hat back on and just run it, and it, it goes great. Uh, check if unit tests were added. Um, if they were, maybe delete the, like just locally, delete the bit of code, the non-test code, and then run the test again and make sure that it fails. If that test is still passing when the thing that's meant to be testing isn't there, there's a problem. So that's something that you can try. And take a look at the profiler. It depends like what kind of code you're looking at. If it's game code, then yeah, open it up in the editor, look at the profiler, make sure there's nothing like, no spikes or memory leaks or anything there. 
And also, if you're unsure, ask for a peer review. Whoever's making this PR wants it to be good, and they don't want to break things. So I'm sure they can take time to like sit with you for 20 minutes and like explain to you what's going on, and do the review that way. A bit like pair programming, but pair reviewing. So I left Unity at the end of 2022 after being there for six years. Um, in general, des like despite all the various dramas that happened with the company through the years, it was a good experience, and I learned a lot. Um, working at a big company can feel like sort of morally weird a lot of the time, um, but honestly every company is going to feel morally weird sometimes. And so early on in your career, I think it's really worth like trying to work at a bigger company because you learn so much about like the global teams and how things run and all these things that even if it's not your dream job, you pack that away in your brain and then you can use it later when you are working at a company that you feel less morally weird about. So I said thank you next to Unity and then I started at Model. So this is my current job, senior software engineer, and I'm also an engineering manager. Um, I don't often write this in my like bios for things because it's not like the majority of my job, but I am also an engineering manager. Um, and I also was moved into that role only after a few months at Model, so um, that's why I'm just putting it on one slide because honestly, I, they happen at the same time. Um, what do I do? I lead the game tech integration team. Unity editor tooling, again, this is something that started early in my career and I use it all the time. Uh, working in client projects, so we're, um, you know, we have users who use our tool and sometimes we need to go into their game and make sure it works. And I've just realized that the next thing is going to come up not paragraph based, but it's fine. Um, so, what am I learning? Uh, startup life. It's different to a big company, it's really different. And I'm glad for the experience. Uh, that's why I've got the many hats icon, because at Startup Life, sometimes you just need to pitch in wherever you can. Like, things need to go out the door, or, or things need to be shown off. You, uh, sometimes I'm doing web code. Sometimes I'm doing, like, you know, platform Python code. Like, I'm, I do a, a bit of everything a lot of time. Um, I've learned some AI basics. Again, this is just through osmosis from working on an AI tool. Um, it seemed really scary when I joined, but AI is just actually fancy maths. Like, don't let anyone tell you that it's this big complicated thing. It's just maths. Like, don't worry about it. Um, publishing on the Unity Asset Store. Now I'm on the other side of that. Like, I, you know, knew of the Unity Asset Store and used it when I worked there, but like now I'm publishing to it, and so that's just a good experience that I'm sure I will use a lot in my career. Um, I'm learning management. Um, I had some experience from like mentoring juniors, and I was an interim manager for a bit at Unity, but now I'm like thrown in the deep end and still learning. And I learned Docker. Um, again, just a cool CI tool to bear in mind. Um, I gave a talk at DevCom last year, and um, that was just really fun. And again, like I had to learn a bit about AI to be able to give this talk and answer questions. That was with my friend Anna. Um, and we also attended Gamescom, so we were like on the booth talking to people. It was, it was a really fun experience. So, Wrapping up, I said I'd come back to the Dunning-Kruger effect and also imposter syndrome. Um, I'm not trying to invalidate my own or anyone else's experiences with imposter syndrome, but I look back on my career and it's like what I said when I was working at Reloaded, like was I having imposter syndrome or was I just at this bit? You know, I, I was just a baby. <laughs> so yeah, there are times where I do feel like I'm weirdly unknowingly tricking everyone and like I'm gonna get hauled out or whatever. But on the grand scheme of it, um, I, I think I'm just, it's just this. So hang on, let me explain what this is. <laughs> um, Dunning-Kruger effect, For if you don't know. Did I call it, sin no. Dunning-Kruger effect, if you don't know, is um, when, you're, when you know less, you might think that you know a lot, like your confidence about it goes up. And then as people learn more, they realize how much out there there is still to learn and it makes their confidence go down. And then it sort of evens out as you start actually learning those things that you didn't know before. And I was going to label my slides with different icons on, like based on where my imposter syndrome was at different parts of my career, but I was looking at it and it did actually kind of follow this linear path of the knowledge. So like I said, I was a baby and so I was down here. But then I kind of got into this part where I maybe thought that I did know lots of stuff and I was like maybe a bit too big for my boots. Like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, like I'd have to like interview the people who worked with me, but I look back on it, I'm like, maybe, maybe I was being a bit too confident actually, given my experience. 
Um, and then you get into this part, and like on this chart, it's like quite small. But I'd say that this part for me was actually a bit more spread out. Like I started to like feel it a lot in the middle of my career as I was going. Oh my gosh, there's so much around me that I still need to know. And that's why I use the imposter again there, because I think this is like the imposter syndrome region of this graph. And then things sort of like mellow out as you do start picking up on what you've been learning. And sometimes I flip flop. Sometimes I go back to the imposter syndrome stage. But generally, I just try and like send to myself and remember, like maybe I do just genuinely need to learn more about this topic, and maybe that's okay. But also, um, I think it was America Ferreira from she was in the Barbie movie, right? She did a talk where she was like, you know, I'm. Uh, I am an outsider in these spaces, so of course I feel like an outsider. And like sometimes that's in play too. And I love that events like this can make people feel like less of an outsider, but like it may maybe it maybe it's okay. <laughs> so, conclusions. Um I was going to make a list of like the different things I'd listed as having learned on previous slides, but it was just actually starting to look like my C V. Um so I think you, you got the gist. But um Every job can be a learning opportunity. I learned something from each role that I was in, even if it felt a bit random or like maybe not quite on the path I wanted to be on. Um, that's why I had those Ariana Grande "Thank You Next" gifts um, come up because she sings about what she took about what she took away from each relationship and that she's thankful for it. And even though some of these jobs weren't definitely weren't perfect, I do I did learn something from each one. Um, and I didn't, I didn't put a whole slide for it, but my first job ever um, before uni was a cleaner. And I put that on my CV when I was applying for the QA test at Reloaded because I didn't have a lot of jobs, right? And the QA manager um, said that he liked to see that on the CV because he liked that it showed I had a work ethic and it showed that I was okay with like boring, repetitive tasks. So again, you can take something even from a job that maybe seems really, really random. So everything can be a, a learning opportunity. Um, and that also means like don't shy away from applying to things that seem maybe too advanced or like out of your comfort zone because you never know. Um, and even if you don't get that job, like even just the applying process can like you can take things away from that and use that later on. Um, imp imposter syndrome does suck, but it also means you're growing. Like if you're feeling like imposter syndrome me, maybe it means that you're just learning more and you're getting to that cultured part of the Dunning Kruger effect graph, right? So try and look on the bright side of it, maybe. Um, and there isn't a correct way to be a programmer. Um, so you can see my career is really weird, and now I'm an engineering manager, and I taught myself to code. Um, also, don't feel prejudiced against self-taught coders. I know no one here would, but it's just like something to, to bear in mind. So, uh, oh yeah, of course, got to have a Barbie, a Barbie gif. I do work hard, and I need to remind myself of that. I like to pretend that I don't, but I do. And so thank you very much for listening, and here's contact if you want. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thanks. It's really nice to hear. We have uh, we have time for a few questions. So if we have any questions in the audience, uh, I can give you the microphone. Or if we have any questions online, just type it in the chat, and uh, we can ask. Uh, maybe it was uh, a lot of information, so you're still digesting it. I can then uh, start with a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I'm going to give uh, context uh, first. So imagine someone is uh, teaching themselves to uh, code, and now this is their first time of uh, applying. And you mentioned these uh, technical tests. I know there are uh, resources to prepare for them, but maybe if you could give advice on uh, maybe how to approach them or what attitude. Uh, to uh, take on going into them? Sure. So I think um, it will vary company to company, but I think don't be scared of like admitting that you might need to like look some things up, right? Like we're, we're not supposed to like have perfect memory. And again, with, with my ADHD, I really can't remember things. And so I'll be very open, like, I'm just going to like look this up on Google. I probably know how to do it, but I'm just going to make sure that I'm doing it right. But also like knowing to um, explain your thought process out loud as you're doing it, because they don't just want to see perfect code. They want to see your reasoning and how you come to conclusions. It's a bit like when you're in school and you need to show you're working on a maths problem. And so you're, if you verbalize that while you're writing code, um, then that I think that can do well in an interview, for sure. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience, maybe? Uh, get the time to, yeah. I can give it. I think for the stream, yes. 
so when you figure out that you like programming and Python, uh, why did you choose to self-teach instead of uh, going for uh, like education? Um, I was impatient and um, I'd just been doing uni and I was like, well, how hard can it be? <laughs> I don't know. It was also like um, money reasons. Like I went to university in the UK and you have to pay for school and stuff there. Maybe I was, if I was living in mainland Europe, I might have gone the, edu like the education route, um, but I couldn't afford to do the whole university thing again. Um, I considered doing a, a college course, like a like post-school, pre-uni college course, but then like the self-teaching was going quite well and I applied for the job at Reloaded and I was like, let's just see how, li how this goes. <laughs> Would you recommend that route for other people that want to try? It maybe. Like I think the industry's changed a lot in the last 10 years and it's maybe more competitive now. If you like education and you can go to university, try it. But like if you would rather like self-teach, like so many of the best coders I know are self-taught and it, it's just about, I, a, a lot of my career is maybe luck-based as well, like I just was in the right place at the right time as, as well, right? So it's, a, it's doing what you can, but I think I got on well with self-teaching and I know others who can. So if maybe traditional education doesn't suit you, then try it. <laughs>